Hi, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar on open banking. Uh, this is the fourth session in Banking on Data, Great Possibilities, Great Responsibilities series, uh, co-hosted by the FDIC and Santa Clara University's Levy School of Business. This partnership brings together the financial, regulatory, and policy sector on the East Coast with the tech sector on the West Coast. Uh, during each of our webinar sessions, speakers discuss the opportunities and challenges for financial institutions and consumers uh, created by the use of big data and applied technologies. We kicked off the series earlier this year with two interesting academic research presentations exploring the possibilities of big and alternative data in finance and banking. We also had two emerging, engaging uh, panel discussions on the use of big and alternative data to provide products and services and the ethics of AI and machine learning. All of the webinar sessions are recorded, so I encourage each of you to visit our website to view them. Today, we are joined by Diane Ellis, who is the Director of the Division of Insurance and Research at the FDIC. In her role, Diane is no stranger to how public policies and programs rely heavily on data-driven insights. Under Diane's leadership, the Division of Insurance and Research is responsible for maintaining the adequacy of the deposit insurance fund and a fair risk-based premium system. They also assess economic and financial sector risk to the banking industry, direct policy-oriented research, conduct analysis for FDIC rulemaking, and manage the collection and publication of bank financial information and statistics. During today's panel discussion, we are joined by four industry leaders who will explore the policy and consumer impact perspectives on en enabling open banking through APIs. They will also discuss privacy laws, data ownership, liability standards, and financial inclusion. Before we get started, I would like to remind all participants to submit questions using the quick Q&A box on your screen. When submitting questions, please include your name and affiliation. All of the webinars are recorded, so today's video will be available for viewing on the event website within the next week. Also, be reminded that this is a five-part webinar series, so please join us for our final session next month on improving financial regulation. And now I turn the program over to Diane. Thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, let me please extend my warm welcome to everyone who's chosen to join us this afternoon. Uh, I am extremely excited and very pleased to be moderating this uh, session with um, these, as Sanji said, industry leaders and on this very interesting, uh, timely, and relevant issue uh, to those of us in the financial services industry. Um, I've uh, been, been following issues of open banking for a while, but I know there's still a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn, and so I'm looking forward to hearing what our panel members have to say today. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by Karen Gordon-Mills with Harvard University, uh, John Pitts with Plaid, Angela Strange uh, with Andreessen Horowitz, and Bill Roberts with the UK's Competition and Markets Authority. Uh, full bios on all of our panelists are on our website. I would encourage you to go there for a little more background on them. And I would also encourage each of them to maybe tell a little bit more about themselves, maybe the first time they, they answer a question. I don't want to spend any more of my time uh, talking. My, my job today will be, hopefully, to ask uh, these uh, uh, folks some interesting questions. Um, uh, that I that I have uh, that I have on my mind uh, to incorporate questions from the audience and uh, to keep my eye on the clock uh, and make sure that we uh, stay stay within time. So we're going to try to cover a, a broad landscape of events uh, today. We're going to talk about uh, standards, um, competition, privacy, and even financial inclusion. So we've got a lot lot of ground to cover. And I'm just going to kick things off by sort of um, asking a level setting question. I'm going to ask all of our panelists just to start us off by talking about um, what open banking means to them. Uh, what would open banking mean in, from their perspective for banking consumers and financial institutions? So let's just, how about each of us take, uh, each of you, uh, you know, take maybe two, three minutes. Um, again, you can further introduce yourself and then, uh, and then kick this off with what a, uh, open banking means to you. And uh, why don't we just do this sort of an alphabetical order first time around, which would mean, um, Karen, it'd mean you, you're, you're up first. I can't hear. Sorry, I think uh, now, mm -hmm. I'm, now I'm unmuted. So thank you so much for um, having me and for doing this great series. Open banking, I believe, is one of the pivotal issues 
in financial services uh, for the coming decade. And getting this right will uh, make the difference between sort of unlocking the full potential that technology brings um, to financial services and banking or making a mess of it. So thank you for uh, bringing this to our attention. I ran the U.S. Small Business Administration for President Obama from 2009 to 2013. So I came into it during the financial crisis. And I bring to this conversation a little bit of a perspective of small businesses and small business lending. But this is also true for consumers. There are so many frictions in the financial system, many of which have to do with what I call information opacity. You just can't see inside a small business. You just can't understand whether that business is credit worthy. And what open banking has the potential to do is use technology to give you an insight into the entire um, uh, financial um, well-being of a borrower and to figure out whether or not they are credit worthy. And in addition, for a consumer, if you can look into the cash flows that come in and out of their banking account, you could create a dashboard that shows them whether or not they have financial help. So we always talk about financial literacy as a big issue, um, but we talk about how are we going to teach more people accounting. One of the things that I think we um, don't see is that with open banking, with access to being able to bring a consumer's data with their permission into a new application, you could show them their own financial picture and you could gain more insights. So I think open banking combined with the new technologies and uh, data aggregation that we have today are the most possibly transformative um, activity. Now, the question is, how do you do this right? Because with great promise comes great risk. And we will be talking about artificial intelligence. We will be talking about data manipulation. We will be talking about who owns which part of their data. So, of course, these are complicated issues. But I, I want to underscore that I think this linkage of the, allowing the customer to own their data, as we will hear um, they did in the UK, and then to permission it will drive more innovation in financial services and will drive more access and opportunity because it will give um, people the financial products that they haven't had access to so far that allow them to get the capital they need to grow and prosper. All right. Thanks, Karen. I appreciate you sort of hitting on the theme of our webinar series, Banking on Data, Great Possibilities, Great Responsibilities. <laughs> um, John, how about, uh, let's go to you next. What's uh, open sure. banking to you? Sure. So, uh, John Pitts, I'm the head of policy at Plaid. Plaid is a uh, open finance data network. And maybe when we start talking about the UK, we'll talk about the difference between open banking and open finance. Um, uh, and prior to my time at Plaid, uh, I was at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So I take a very strong consumer-centric uh, perspective on what this means. And I think the best way for me to explain what open banking can mean uh, is to tell two very quick stories. So first story, uh, you call an Uber and you get into that car. The car is not made by Uber. The phone is not made by Uber. Uber is helping to arrange the driver, but also within that Uber app, the map is not made by Uber. It's made by Google. The payment process by which you pay the driver is not made by Uber. It's provided by Stripe or some other payment service provider. But from the consumer experience, that's, that's largely invisible. All of those different companies and pieces are working together to provide the consumer with a new and different service that wasn't available. And I don't think I'll shock anyone by saying that's not how financial services works today, not in the United States, right? We don't have that ability to combine different bank offerings, different non-bank offerings, different payment offerings together in a way that's easy and sort of Lego brick connects them together in order to offer a new service to the consumer by building on different sources uh, and, and different offerings. 
So let me try and sort of tell that same story from a consumer's per perspective in the financial services space. And uh, I think this will encapsulate what I think open finance can mean. You go into the grocery store, you're buying a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread, um, you're using your debit card. Gallon of milk, loaf of bread, that's going to be seven fifty. dollars You have $5 in your debit account, in, in your uh, deposit account. You're going to overdraft. Right now, uh, if you've got overdraft enabled, really all that's happening is you're sticking your debit card in. Uh, you are overdrawing your account. You are incurring a $25 fee, and that's the end of the day. You know, that's, that's sort of what the consumer can control. They can either opt not to make the purchase uh, or to incur the overdraft fee. What if when you, let's say we're not using a debit card now, we're using a debit card that's on your phone using Apple Pay or Google Pay or something like that. Uh, you're using open banking through a service like Plaid. So now an app can tell you, hey, actually, we see your balance. We are alerting you right now in the middle of this transaction that you're about to overdraft your account. We can either instantly put funds in your account to cover that distance, uh, that gap, at a fee, or we're also connected to your payroll provider, and we know that you're going to get paid tomorrow. We can advance you some of your payroll from tomorrow into your account right now, again, to cover that gap and prevent you from incurring that overdraft fee. And suddenly what you've got is multiple parts of the consumer's financial life, their, uh, their payment service, their deposit service, their payroll service are all connected with each other and sharing information with each other at the consumer's direction. As Karen said, I think that's really fundamentally the most important part of this. And the result is the consumer has control over their finances in a way that they never had before. And multiple companies, both banks and non-banks, are able to work together with each other to create new offerings that aren't available in the market today. So I think that's what open finance really means to me is that possibility of interconnectedness with the consumer controlling things at the center. That's great, great. So we've already we've already demonstrated that we've got someone here with a small business perspective and a consumer perspective. Let's uh, let's go across the pond now uh, to Bill uh, and maybe get a bit get a regulatory perspective. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's delightful to be here. I'd rather be with you in person, but uh, this is, I guess this is the next, next best thing. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Yes, I'm a regulator now. Uh, prior to that, I worked in information publishing, legal, scientific, and, and news. Um, prior to that, I worked for the, the UK's equivalent of Consumer Reports, where I was uh, Chief Operating Officer there. So I have a bit of a consumer perspective too. Um, what does open banking mean to us? Well, open banking means primarily to us a way of addressing competition issues that we we faced in the UK, where we we have a system where, unlike the U, 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 US, we have four very large banks who have about 80% of the market, and they've had that for a very, very long time. The whole sector is characterized by a lack of engagement, low switching rates, Pe people in the UK much more likely to get divorced than they are to change their banks. Um, so open banking for us was meant to be a game changer, not, not a, a tinkering at the edges. Uh, it, was, it was meant to allow people other than banks to provide banking services. And, and if you're looking for a cliche, it was to put uh, consumers back in control of their own data. Um, the benefits that we've seen so far include all, all the things that have been mentioned so far. Um, that, yeah, it, it, it can help people who are busy, not necessarily vulnerable, um, through applications which point out to them things they may not have noticed, that the, the mortgage, the fixed rate mortgage they had has gone into floating rate and they didn't notice it, so they're paying a couple of hundred dollars a month more than they should be. Um, it, it's enabled them to get better credit ratings than they would otherwise have, particularly if they're, they have a thin credit file. Small businesses have very, very high take-up rates by small businesses in the UK for whom it works perfectly because it plugs into the cloud-based account, accounting packages that they currently use. So you don't have to spend your Friday evening reconciling or typing in manually the, the payments you've received in your bank. Uh, reconciling those with your accounts receivable ledger, that all just happens automatically. So you can put your feet up on a Friday night rather than sit in front of a screen. 
Um, and there's been some other and slightly surprising benefits that have, have happened in the last two years since we've been running open banking uh, that maybe we'll come on to later. But I'll stop there and give the floor to okay. someone else. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, Angela, why don't you round us out here? What does open banking mean to you? Yeah. Hello. I'm Angela Strange, uh, general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. We invest in, in many things. I focus primarily on financial services at the early to late stage, and that's everything from real estate to infrastructure to a lot of financial inclusion, which very much relates to this topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll take this in, in two parts, maybe one where it's already gotten us and then two, the, the potential and many of my esteemed panelists have, have made these points. So first, it can really mean consumer and small business choice to what, to what Karen said. And I think of this in terms of may the best products win. And I'd say right now we're in the uh, moderately open banking phase, but you can look at already what the power by companies like Plaid and others have done. And what they've done is that they've spawned thousands of experiments of new fintech companies that wouldn't have been possible before if you couldn't get access to some of that data. So for example, companies like Earnin, which allows you access to money that you've already earned, but your paycheck hasn't landed yet, wouldn't be possible if Earnin wasn't able to see when your paycheck was going to land and what your cash flows were. And so underwriting data that wouldn't have previously been accessible. Things like how do you underwrite a mortgage faster? Now, instead of uploading pay stubs, you can just link into your bank. And so we've seen a lot of new companies that benefit you know, across the socioeconomic spectrum and things that move a lot faster. The piece that I think is really exciting about open banking as it moves forward, and, and John used this uh, Lego term, if you think like, what did it used to take to start an internet company? It would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. You would have to literally go to Fry's, which is an electronic store in Palo Alto, buy some servers, load them onto a truck, raise some money so that you can spin up all of these instances, right? And nobody does that anymore. You open your laptop and you spin up an instance on Amazon Web Services. And so they have provided compute and storage as a service very, very easy. As you think about banking, a critical layer of the analogy of compute and storage is how do you get the data that you need as a service? And if you can imagine if it was that easy, similar to spinning up an infrastructure layer like Amazon Web Services, you would have all of these composable building blocks such that you could build new neobanks, but then any company in theory could add financial services. And we're seeing this already very, very early days, like Lyft and Uber are adding driver bank accounts, Shopify is adding banking services for its merchants. And I very much think that this is where this is going as we become more and more open. Thanks. You guys have uh, set a sort of a great, great foundation uh, for our discussion. So we'll we'll sort of uh, go off from here. Um, I have a couple of follow up questions, sort of on the issue of standards. And and Bill, I'd like to start with you. You, as you indicated, you've implemented open banking in the UK, and you shared with us some of the results. But would you say there were any surprises? Um, and uh, if so, can you can you share some of those surprises with us? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, the, I guess the first surprise was there was very little disagreement over the, the standards that, that we applied in the UK. Um, and this is one, one thing that differs. The UK um, execution of open banking is very different from the rest of uh, the rest of Europe in that although the second payment services directory basically required banks to share data using APIs, the big difference in the UK was that we required them to share data using the same APIs, the same standards, which would make it easier for a developer to produce applications because they're working with the same technology. It's a big difference. Um, I thought there would be a lot of argument about which standards to use, but there wasn't. That was one of the most, um, it just went straight through, given the, given the existence of international standards, which could simply be taken off the shelf. Second big surprise was, which we fixed, was um, we left the decision on uh, the authentication journeys in the in the competitive space, as it were. We allowed the banks to decide what those should look like, and what they came back with was not not very good from a user point of view. Uh, you would be invited to click through fourteen different screens, then you would get a single single use pass uh, pin number, then somebody from a a call center would ring you and ask you what the, the maiden name of your dog was. And this was not a very used user-friendly experience. So we switched, basically. 
And to get a long story short, we switched to biometric authentication, uh, app to app authentication, which made a huge difference to to take up. And we learned that, yeah, it has to be secure, it has to be useful, but it also has to be simple to use if consumer adoption is going to happen. Third surprise was uh, SME um, take up. It's been much more rapid than I anticipated. Some estimates put it at about 50% of penetration in the, in the first couple of years we've had, uh, mainly because of the, the way it fits so neatly with cloud-based accounting systems. Um, but maybe you shouldn't be surprised. I mean, who bought the first mobile phones? Who bought the first fax machines? Yeah, small businesses. Uh, they, are, they are earlier adopters if, they've, if they can see something that saves some time and, and possibly money as well. And the third big surprise we've had is on the on the payments side uh, that um, I, I could have anticipated that because of the advantages of open banking payments in terms of getting your money more quickly if you're a merchant um, and lower charges than you would if you used cards, um, I never anticipated that the UK government would take up um, open banking payment the way it has. So... Uh, 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 our equivalent of the Internal Revenue Service is now offering open banking payment as a, a means of paying your tax, whether it's sales tax, individual tax, personal tax, or corporation tax, because they get the money quicker and it's cheaper. And the UK uh, Internal Revenue Service takes about 11, well, 15, the equivalent of $15 billion a year in tax on cards. So it's, it's maybe saving quite a little bit of money and getting its money quicker. So those, I guess those are the three or four biggest surprises we had. Okay, great. Um, Karen, I've, I've got a question for you. I'm guessing that you're probably, maybe you're not surprised uh, at, 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 the, um, uh, at the reaction in the UK, the small business and the government take up. But I also, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But I also want to ask you about consumers. Um, you know, I, I, as you're, as every, I think everyone here is probably aware, on July 9th, the White House issued an executive order that encourages our Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, to issue rules allowing customers to download their banking data and take it with them. I'd be interested in your perspective on how consumers um, should think about how this will affect them. The UK um, example is one that I've been following for quite a long time. I wrote a book in pre-pandemic that came out called Fintech Small Business in the American Dream, um, you know, that made this argument that we were about to enter this transformative moment, but that it really hinged on getting the right regulatory framework. And um, I went around and asked uh, a then Treasury official, um, tell me, I don't really understand our situation at the moment. Who owns my bank data? Do I own it or does the bank own it in 2019? And the answer was, it's murky. And I tell that story, I say, you know, for a regulation, a answer that says it's murky is a bad answer. So we need to do better. And I'm glad that we have um, now an executive order on this. But what we really need um, is the kind of clarity that you see in the UK and the EU and in other nations in Australia around who owns your data and how do you permission it and what are the standards? And the great news for the US is that we have, it's true, a much more complicated banking system because we have these fabulous community banks. But we also um, you know, have these examples around the world that we can learn, as Bill said, from their uh, successes and from their mistakes or surprises. If we do this right, I think, um, you know, consumers will find this seamless. Small business will find it seamless because what consumers and small businesses want is that same customer experience that they are having in other places uh, with their purchasing experiences. The only issue is safety and security of their financial data. There are two areas where of data where, you know, people really... Um, you know, are going to experience vast changes, financial services and healthcare, and both of them are really, you know, very risky areas. You really worry about your healthcare data getting missing or confused, and of course you worry about your money. So what a consumer wants to know is that the CFPP and others will create a structure that is simple enough to create innovation, 
to drive the plaids and the fintechs and all the investments um, that Andreessen Horowitz have to give you more options and that will protect them the way they're used to be protecting by the banking regulations. Everybody complains about the banking regulations, but in general, they do keep the money safe and they do keep the system safe. So what we need is a more forward looking response to this executive order that really defines these pieces. And I think that's the work that you all are uh, setting out to do. Yep. John, I'd be interested in sort of your take on this question as well. And maybe maybe I'll just put a slightly different spin on it. You know, what would change if banks are required to provide authorized access um, to, to consumers' data um, uh, to, to others, including tech companies? Uh, so I, I think one of the most significant changes is going to be on uh, sort of the number of choices and competitive offerings that a consumer has, right? I think uh, we see the same thing in the U.S. This will be no surprise to anyone on this webinar that uh, bank account relationships are very sticky. Once a consumer has got that account open, they're unlikely to change it. They may add accounts. They may open new ones with new service providers. Um, but often in the past, if you're denied a service by your bank, that's sort of the end of the journey for you, right? You you don't have an option uh, unless you wanted to go try and find someone else or go to a, you know, let's say it's a loan, a lower quality lending product, like a payday loan or, or something like that. Um, I think the biggest change in freeing up this movement of data is once the consumer can control their financial data, they're also more in control of the choices they can get. And I don't want to suggest that, that means that somehow the bank account is going to become less important for the consumer, actually quite the opposite. What we've seen in the U.S. is uh, consumers who have a connected bank account actually do more of their business on that bank account. It becomes even more important for them, but it becomes really less of a big box store where sort of everything that you can get is in the store. And if it's not in the store, you're not going to get it. And more of a platform where you can attach new services onto that bank. Um, and they're not necessarily services provided by that bank. And I, I think actually they're really not even services attached to that bank. They are services that sort of you can facilitate with your data uh, that you think of as part of your financial life, but ultimately they're disconnected from the account itself. And I think to turn the question around, like um, what will change when you can't do, or when you have the option of doing this through permission as opposed to uh, uh, directly, a, a lot of that question is actually up in the air right now for the CFPB, but also for the prudential regulators, because there's some big unopened questions there. I think the biggest unopened question, uh, unanswered question is what is the bank's responsibility in that circumstance, right? Right now, and I've actually, I, I have uh, done trainings with uh, prudential examiners that are uh, where I do a, a fun sort of trick on them. I say, you know, if you go to your dry cleaner and they ask for your name uh, and a payment method and you give them a written check with your name, address, lots of PII on it, and your account and routing number, the sensitive data, financial data that Karen was just talking about. Is the bank responsible for ensuring that the dry cleaner is safe? And every examiner says, no, 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 of course, that would be insane that the bank has to check the dry cleaner to see if they're safe. When you then say, well, what if the bank has an API and the dry cleaner retrieves that same information from the API? And most people still say, uh, I, no, I don't think the bank has a responsibility there. If you ask that question in the opposite direction, if you start with the API example and then go to the check example, it flips. It goes from 80-20 to 20-80, where if you talk about the digital space, the immediate reaction is, oh, there's a digital connection between those two companies. The bank has to be in charge of everywhere that data flows, no matter where it flows uh, downstream. And I think reconciling those points of view to what is a bank's responsibility? What is a platform like Plaid's responsibility? What is the responsibility of a third party within a regulatory framework that we've built that largely focuses on banks but now will, I think, need to expand to accommodate lots of different types of companies that are dealing with financial data. 
is going to be the single most uh, determinative question in terms of what changes when you have authorized access versus direct access. Because we've been living in the direct access world for years. I can take a picture of my check or send someone a copy of my balance statements right now if I want to. It's very inefficient, it's very labor intensive, but my banking data is out there already if I choose to let it out there. The question is, does making it digital change things? I think it changes some things, but the question is what? And uh, I think that's part of what the CFPB is going to answer in its 1033 rulemaking, I hope. Uh, I hope it's something that gets further addressed through the interagency uh, guidance on third party responsibilities. I think that's a huge open question. And I think it, it's going to be answered by how some of these non-bank entities are ultimately regulated and supervised. Plaid, for example, has uh, raised its hand to the CFPB and said, we have a vital role in uh, providing data access to consumers and to uh, banks and non-banks we should be supervised as a result of that vital role. It, 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 it's the right thing to do. In the UK, we have a license as an account information service provider and a payment initiation service provider. So we have a uh, regulated role there as well. I think those questions are gonna be the key questions uh, that get answered that will start shaping that, what does it mean to have permissioned access? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to stick in one more question about standards. Uh, I'm going to ask it, uh, and then I'm going to move on to competition, which we've all been kind of, uh, which everyone here on the panel has been already kind of hinting at. But um, Angela, I want to ask you a question about technical standards. We're going to get to sort of legal uh, requirements in a bit, but uh, I have a question about technical standards. Um, you know, Bill was talking earlier about starting with a dog's maiden name and then going to biometric uh, 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 information. And I'm curious from your perspective, are, are we headed to where we're going to need a universal identifier for customers? across the banking system? Um, if so, how would that work? And is that something where a government agency needs to step in or is that something that the market can figure out? Yeah, I think a standard would be incredibly powerful. And uh, I, I will leave it to Bill to come up with a clever analogy. So he's got had about five so far in this conversation. Um, but it's actually interesting to look you know, beyond payments and throughout history of like, when haven't there been standards and when has a standard come in and made like a very, very powerful change? Got lots of examples. The, one of the biggest ones is shipping containers. Now this has nothing to do with payments, right? But prior to the 1940s and 50s, you could put stuff in a container. It was all sorts of different sizes. You couldn't even in the US transfer it from one railway to the other railway because it didn't fit, let alone different types of containers internationally. And then in the 40s and 50s, along came various standards bodies. And interestingly, shipping containers is very much credited with driving a lot of global trade. Right, so very basic standard. We've got a lot of standards in payments. You just take, you know, ISO 20, 2022, um, which is not mandated, but because that there is a smart format that everybody understands across different payment types, different geographies, it very much helps payments exchange. And so I think, you know, you could argue, well, it's not that hard to parse out different types of data from the bank accounts. Everybody is somewhat doing it. But if we had a standard, I think it would very much increase the speed at which it was done, the connectivity between different banks around the world, and ultimately lower costs, which will spawn more consumer choice. Um, and so, and I think we're seeing early examples of this if you look over into Europe, for instance, right? Now banks have agreed, okay, we need to build this and do this. Many banks, most banks, in fact, don't have the technical teams to figure this out in a really strong and efficient way, nor you could argue should the same banks all around the world be spending the same technical effort doing the same thing. And so along come projects like open source projects, like the open bank project, which is reference libraries that any bank can use, which does things like help them connect into their core, help with the authentication, help with providing the same metadata that everyone's gonna use, and so if there was an agreed upon standard, you could imagine whether it's an open source company or another company, which could provide these libraries to speed along all banks around the world being able to comply with this, and especially in the US where this doesn't exist today. Yep, okay. All right, yeah, let me move on now to the area of competition. And all of your prior answers have sort of hinted at competition. So I was gonna ask how open banking uh, might impact the competitive landscape for banks and fintechs. I, I kind of know, uh, what you all will say. So let me let me just see if there's anything. Let me throw it out generally to the panel and see if there's anything 
uh, anyone else would like to add to what they might have already said. And maybe you could address, you know, wh whether it's possible that it could improve the uh, American competitiveness abroad. Um, is anybody have, else want to add? Go ahead, Karen. I'd love to jump in on um, a counterintuitive point, which is about community banks. One of the things that we've seen so far is that the community banking organizations have been very much against the idea of opening up uh, open banking. They won't control the data. Fintechs, you know, will come along and maybe take their business. And I think that is that uh, exactly the opposite will be true. That open banking could be the greatest um, new shot in the arm for our fabulous network of community banks. It's, it's sort of one of the treasures of the US system. And of course, you know, the number of banks when I was running the SBA was 8,000, it's under 5,000 now. So this is, you know, a group under some stress. And I am all for other competitors and uh, uh, banking options. But I think what will happen if you really get open banking going is that all of these new um, uh, data aggregators will provide solutions. And if banks can uh, make use of some of the technology to actually plug this stuff into their core system, you could see a community banker going back to being a relationship banker. So a small business walks into a community bank today and the banker says, you know, let's sit down and I'll do an Excel spreadsheet of your whole business and I'll try to, you know, look at your tax returns and I'll plug it all in. And three months later, I'll give you an answer. And of course, that is not a consumer friendly um, activity. But if they could, you know, open up their computer and download your credit cards, whether they're with the bank or not, all the banking information, all the things that are happening with competitive uh, small businesses of the same size, you could get a thousand dry cleaners, you know, and compare. You are pretty well uh, soon going to know whether you want to um, make a loan to this credit worthy small business. And that means that the banker, the community banker can go back to having a relationship with that banker, uh, that customer, knowing what it is, you know, they're um, potential is as a business manager. And I think that could be a magical competition, uh, magical, uh, you know, positive for competition and for the competitive position of community banks. Mm -hmm. Karen, if, if I can jump in on that, because I, I think that's exactly right. And I actually maybe have something helpful to say in that direction of it, it's not even an in the future we at Plaid at least are starting to see this now. So uh, the uh, this is this is a credit union, not a bank. So uh, I, I'm I'm sorry for breaching the uh, the the barrier between the two. Uh, but we worked with uh, Michigan State University's uh, federal credit union earlier this year, and one of the things Plaid has started doing is specifically for community banks and credit unions who don't have a billion dollar IT budget like some of the larger banks do, aren't developing their own APIs, we're building APIs for them, right? So instead of them having to build an API for other people to connect to, we can build an API for them to connect to that gets them all the connectivity of the largest banks uh, in the country. And so we call it uh, Plaid Exchange, um, but we're certainly not the only ones doing this. We're also uh, board members of the Financial Data Exchange, which is building a similar project, a universal API that any bank can adopt if it can build it itself. And we're starting to see real interest from community banks, credit unions who view this as essential to their digital future. Actually, the PPP lending process was one of the biggest catalysts that we saw where suddenly all of these community banks had a very strong incentive to make small business loans, uh, but needed data from those small businesses that was not necessarily easily accessible until we built an API that those credit unions and community banks could use to get that data from small businesses and issue them a PPP loan in as little as 24 hours. So I, I think we're maybe even further along than uh, than you just indicated, Karen, in terms of that journey of community banks recognizing that this is a competitive advantage for them. But there still is 
you know, some rapids to go through. There's still risk ahead. And I think one of the biggest competitive risks is that there will be a digital gap that opens up between large banks and small banks where the rules on what data you can share and who you share it with differ from bank to bank in a way that the consumer can't easily see. So that at the very largest banks that have the ability to, you know, sign multi-billion dollar deals, the consumer has access to 5,000 apps. But at a small bank, they only have access to 10, 20, 30, or 40 apps. Or at bank one, the consumer can share just their transactional data, but bank two, they can share their payments data. That creates a bunch of inconsistency in the market that's going to make it harder for open banking to turn into a competitive advantage because the competitive playing field won't be level. It'll differ from bank to bank to bank to credit union. You know, Bill, I'm curious, uh, as, as you indicated earlier, you know, the UK's banking system is different than the US banking system, but nevertheless, um, is there anything you have observed um, after implementing o UK open banking standards that's uh, in the way of uh, impact on market structure? Have, have small banks benefited as much as larger ones? Yes, certainly they have. Um, I, j I just make the, the kind of obvious point that there are a number of competition vectors that we envisage would would operate here. So yeah, we were, we're envisaging that new players would come in providing banking services who weren't banks. So suddenly uh, there are new new intermediaries, if you want, and they're saying, well, to a small business, we, we can find you loans. You don't have to go to your bank for an unsecured loan. We can do that for you. Before the bank had unique access to your, your transaction history, now we have access to that. So we can get you, you can offer you many more deals than you would get from your, your bank. So they can, they can compete for the bank's most profitable customers. Uh, and, and the consumer side of things in the UK, most, most checking accounts, most current accounts are free if in credit. But it's, they're free, but it's, it's like people say about uh, some of the big, big platform products. If, if the product is free, you are the product. Uh, and you are the product because you're putting your, your pay in their bank and you're not receiving interest on it, but they're, they're busily lending it out to some, somebody down the road from you who's, who's buying a house on a mortgage. Uh, so yeah, not necessarily free. So one application of open banking is to say, well, you know, tell us what you want to keep in terms of a cash balance in your, in your checking account. Um, you're not going to get any interest on that. Let's let, we'll take it off somewhere else. We'll take you to rate setter for you. And, and here's the deal. We'll guarantee that you will always get a better rate of return from the, the account we shift it to, uh, than you will get from your bank and then we'll ship it back. We can model your cash flow. We know when you'll need it. We'll put it back in your bank account later. So it automates savings. So we anticipated one vector of competition, which was new intermediaries coming in, providing banking services, but they're not banks. Uh, the second, I suppose it's obvious, the second vector was um, the banks themselves and how they would change the big banks. Um, and here, I, I often say this, I used, I used to work in newspapers um, and the attitude to the banks in the UK to open banking has been a bit like um, publishers' reactions to the internet in, in the UK, that some saw it as a threat, some saw it as an opportunity, uh, but, but they all saw it as inevitable. Uh, and that's very much the case in the UK. And you can see that some banks are, react, are becoming much more agile in what they're doing. And they're, they're doing cute things. You think, oh, that's really good. I wonder why they didn't do that 20 years ago. And the reason they didn't do it 20 years ago is because somebody else uh, wasn't doing it and showing them up, if you want. And a lot of them had pretty bad technology, quite honestly, they're, they're on their basic banking platforms. So we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing the big banks um, changing and offering services they would never have offered before, uh, before open banking, as well as we're seeing the competition from the agile, the agile new entrance into to banking services. Mm-hmm. All right, it, it, John, uh, I, I think it was you. I think you said, uh, referenced earlier uh, in your remarks, something about stickiness of deposits or some, some sort of something about deposits. And, and if not, I'm going to ask you this question anyway. Um, <laughs> right now, you know, banks count on retail deposits as a really stable source of funding. Does open banking, um, you know, uh, uh, pose a threat to that? Um, if open banking allows customers to move their relationships around real uh, easily, 
Uh, you know, does that create liquidity issues someday for banks? So uh, I, I did say it earlier. So thank goodness I can now uh, uh, do my own homework uh, from the assignment I gave myself earlier. Uh, I, I think the answer is no. So let me let me just give you what we've seen so far at Plaid. Um, the bank account that a consumer uses to connect to apps and services, after that account becomes the connected account, we see much greater use of that account by the consumer um, as a primary account. So, uh, for example, a 28% increase on the monthly average debit card spend from the connected account. That's not the consumer spending 28% more than they would have previously. That is them shifting spending from other accounts uh, that aren't connected into the connected account. A 7% increase in transaction frequency on that account. And I think this is the most critical one from a safety and soundness, liquidity and deposits perspective. Uh, a 9% increase in users depositing their payroll into that linked account. So. You know, as, as I think most in the banking sector know, once you've got that direct deposit into that account, um, that's a sticky consumer who's really, you know, burrowed into that account as their top of wallet primary account. Uh, it's so important that a lot of banks offer pretty substantial incentive, incentives to consumers to make that account their direct deposit account. So what we've seen so far is uh, nine percent increase. That's better than a lot of uh, marketing-driven direct deposit initiatives that banks run, and it's simply because the bank has allowed the consumer to connect that account to third-party services. It is not resulting in a flight of capital away from that bank account. It's actually turning that bank account into a hub of the consumer's full digital financial life. Mm, okay. Um, all right. So, Angela, maybe final question on competition to you. How how can banks and fintechs prepare to take advantage of uh, open banking today? I think from a from a bank perspective, like if you look flashback even not that long ago, right? Like banks used to have geographic lock in. I would have to physically go to my branch. So there's not that many banks around. In some instances, I would choose there. Then they had data lock in. It was very very difficult to move. I think the smartest mindset, and we're very much seeing this with, you know, we work with lots of banks across our portfolio, either our fintechs partner with them, or, you know, they're um, just trying to get up to speed on the sort of newest innovations, take the mindset that open banking is inevitable. Therefore, there's going to be no data lock-in. Consumers are going to be free to switch, free to do what they want. And if you take that mindset, then it very much forces you to say, well, what do I have a competitive advantage in that I provide better to my customers, better than anyone else, right? So take the example of community banks, many of them very, very good at commercial banking, commercial banking for a specific type of business that might happen to be in their area. And they might still want to provide mortgages and other services that might not be their primary thing, but they want to have it as part of their platform doesn't make sense for them to build all of that tech themselves that probably don't even have those technology teams. Wouldn't it be to their advantage if there was open banking and different libraries and different partnerships to be able to bring in best in class services that are not core to exactly what they do, but allow them to provide their customers in a holistic way? And so I think, you know, and a couple of people have made this point, it very much prepares, how do I be really great at one or two things? And then I can supplement the services around that. Okay, great. Okay, um, now let's, I'm going to shift gears and talk about privacy. And privacy has come up uh, in some of the comp remarks uh, already as well. Very important topic with regard to open banking. So my sort of just introductory question is, how does open banking impact privacy and consumer protection? And how do the definitions of who is a protected individual and what is considered protected data you know, vary across the uh, federal and state laws here uh, in the U.S.? Um, anybody want to sort of dive in and, and talk privacy first? <laughs> Karen, can I ask you to take the lead on that? <laughs> and maybe you could uh, also ask, do, do, we need, do we need comprehensive data privacy legislation here? I think the answer to that is yes. We've seen um, this in Europe. Uh, GDPR is a standard. All of our banks in the U.S., the ba major banks, are dealing with this. So this is no surprise to them. And they're all wondering why, you know, why doesn't somebody just set up the playing field so that they don't have uncertainty? 
Um, I think the really complicated question comes with what is, you know, protected data? And that comes um, with the new data innovations, because we all know that your personal information, your account information, your social security, you know, that's the baseline data. And you do not want that stolen or shared um, inappropriately. But what about um, a credit score that artificial intelligence has taken different data from Plaid and from all these sources and they have created a score that says you are a really good dry cleaner. You are a really, um, you know, top rate consumer for this kind of loan or for this kind of payment. Should that be public? Should you have transparency into that score yourself? What if artificial intelligence creates something, but they built it by, uh, on a mistake? What if there was a mistake somewhere in the data? Do you get to go back like you can now in your FICO score, your um, a financial score and say, uh, I petitioned to have this mistake corrected. This is the, you know, this is the proper information. So I think the most complicated piece of that um, will be about the evolution of the data into sort of the secondary but highly valuable um, distributed data pieces and who has transparent, who owns that, who has transparency into that and how do you make sure that the consumer uh, or the business is protected? Mm -hmm. John, there's a question in the chat that I'm, I'm going to direct to you. Uh, John's point about defining responsibilities in the regulatory ecosystem is spot on. I don't know if this question is for you, but since you got the compliment, I'm going <laughs> to aim it towards you. Banks are currently pointed to as the gatekeepers for safety and data, but should they be? If not, should the downstream fintechs and financial service providers be regulated to the same extent? Banks are if they are managing consumer PII, and that question is from Janine Del Monte. So thank you uh, for that question. And John, what what do you think? Uh, no, thank you. It's it's a really really good question. Uh, let me say at, at a high level, my perspective is that the responsibility should follow the data as it moves through the ecosystem, right? And that means that the bank has a responsibility. Let, let's take a very simple like a bank to a plaid to a betterment. When the bank is holding the consumer's data, there's actually regulations right now about accuracy on how the bank holds that consumer's data. There should be requirements on what consent or permissions look like for that data to move from the bank to Plaid, and there should be responsibility on the accuracy of that data in transit. But once it has reached Plaid, it's now Plaid's responsibility, right? Once we send it down to an additional party, we are responsible for accurately sending it to that additional party. That additional party is responsible for accurately maintaining it and not using it in violation of any of the relevant laws. Um, that's not really the framework we have right now. And uh, I would actually go slightly further than Karen by saying, we don't just want a national law, we are kind of backing our way into national privacy regulation right now by accident, right? Which is so many global companies need to comply with GDPR and need to comply with CCPA in California that it sort of just makes sense to figure out how to comply with them everywhere, even if there isn't some sort of universal requirement. And what that means is you're sort of cludging together different privacy regimes uh, piecemeal and trying to figure out how to best manage who is responsible for what um, without actually having a comprehensive picture. And what that means practically right now is that a lot of those responsibilities, who is responsible for what, are not being determined by regulation. They're being determined by individual data access agreement negotiations between individual banks and individual aggregators, which does not feel to me like it's sustainable because it may mean that the responsibilities differ from bank to bank to aggregator to aggregator to fintech to fintech because they're all contractual rather than being universal across the entire ecosystem. So mm -hmm. I'm strongly in favor of a pretty clear allocation of responsibility and liability where uh, it is tied to who is holding the consumer's data at any given moment and what those responsibilities are. In terms of who should be regulated, how should they be regulated, um, I'll say generally, 
there's a difference between regulation and supervision. I'm probably preaching not only to the choir, I'm probably preaching to the pre priest here when I say there's a difference between supervision and regulation. Um, but many of these companies, most fintech companies are regulated in one way or another, whether it be state or federal. A question of whether they should be supervised, I think that's specific to the type of offering that they're making. Um, I think some should be supervised, some uh, probably don't merit that within the current regulatory structure. But I do think we should be very open to the idea that a regulatory framework that in large part was designed on 1970s sort of brick and mortar pen and paper technology may be ready for a fairly broad based revamp to uh, better fit a sort of digital and interconnected financial services world. That's, that's, that's probably too big of a statement to mic drop on and then pass to, to <laughs> someone else, but I'm going to do that. That's okay. Well, I'm going to ask a follow-up that, that, that maybe you could take or someone else. No. <laughs> the question is, do we, do we have any useful models to look at? We've got the newly passed Uniform Law Commission's Uniform Personal Data Protection Act. Does that offer, offer useful guidance as a model Data Privacy Act. You've also got the um, GDPR in the, the EU and the UK. What are, are there any good good models to look at here? So I, I guess I will take that it just briefly to say I think there are a, a, a number of good models, but uh, to extend what I think uh, Karen said and, and where Karen was going, maybe beyond where Karen would take it, but I'll, I'll take it there. I actually think right now in the U.S. market in many ways, it is more important to pick a set of rules and apply them so that everyone has predictability and certainty, as opposed to, you know, continue to meander through the garden and look for the single most beautiful flower, right? We, we kind of just need to, we've got lots of good examples uh, from Canada, from Australia. I mean, India's got some great uh, data protection and privacy laws. Like the examples are myriad the choice of applying some set of privacy requirements in the US that are uniform and consistent is much more important than which of those examples we pick at least at this moment. And now don't hold me to that. If we pick a terrible example, then I'm gonna eat my own words. But like, I think having that predictability is what matters more than which form of it we choose. Karen, you've probably thought about this as well. Uh, any, uh, what's your view on sort of models and uh, privacy law, the need for comprehensive privacy laws? I. I second um, what John was saying, but I, I'm curious, Bill, wh whether you advise us to go this way. Um, maybe you can chime in and, and uh, tell us if there's a, a mistake in that offering, because I, I at this point would go with, um, you know, the ubiquitous GDPR and, and, uh, and let, you know, with any modifications that wise counsel would make. Uh, well, I, I, I kind of need to duck that because we're a competition authority and there are other other regulators with, with um, who have authority over privacy. What, what I think it might be useful to make is the distinction between privacy and security, uh, which was an issue was an issue for us. And they're two slightly different things in that um, the the, uh, the the nature of the risk varies with the data that you're you're transferring uh, and also what you can do with it so one thing we've tried to do in the uk and indeed in, in europe is to make controls risk related such that um, the stringency of the controls and the scrutiny of the um, providers in the in the sector is, is very much related to what what how bad things could be if they went wrong so for example if you take uh, the example of read the read write ability that we have an open banking such that somebody can authorize payment out of your account or you they can move money about out of your account um the other that that is clearly a greater risk in terms of security than someone who can simply look at look at the transactions to your bank account so in the in the case of the former the read write the payment initiation side of things then there is absolutely strict liability for for the bank so if something does go wrong and you have plenty of plenty of lines of defense to stop things going wrong but if they do go wrong then the the consumer simply goes to the bank and the bank makes them whole the bank will then sort out whether with third party providers uh, whose responsibility it is but it's a very simple method of of um 
making the consumer whole again if, if something does does go wrong. I, I should say, incidentally, we um, that was maybe one of our other surprises that we thought issues of privacy um, would um, would be an inhibitor of consumer and well, it'd be, yes, adoption generally. Um, and it was a very interesting difference demographically in the, when we did the research in terms of the responses we got. And I remember now sitting in a sitting in a hotel in the north of England one cold and wet night, listening talking to people about this. And the um, the younger group of people, when we put it to them, would they be interested in in this thing? We had a mock up. We said, "Look, you can do this. You can do that. Press that button. Look what happens here." Uh, and they said, "Oh, okay." Um, yeah, what's in it for me again? What, how do I get? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, if I could do that, I might think about that. Older people um, tended to be rather more nervous about sharing that, their data. Um, they they didn't do the immediate calculation of what's the value exchange here. Um, small businesses were more like the, the, the younger groups that we talked to uh, in the sense that they say, will it save me time? Will it save me money? Yeah, okay, I might think about it if, if it'll do that. So there's, I think there's also a trade-off in terms of the risks people are prepared to take relative to the value that the, the product is going to give them. So the, the consumer might have a different view about um, sharing even sensitive data if there's a, a payoff for them, if there's a genuine value exchange. Yeah, you know, Angela, I was good. I'd like to ask you if you kind of weigh in on that. Um, people's inclination towards sharing information. Um, there has been some emphasis lately on reducing the size of digital footprints. Apple's uh, giving, uh, uh, providing features that ask consumers if they want to share their activity and so on and so forth. Is that going to slow or hinder the push towards open banking, or is that just older people and eventually, eventually the population will be totally acclimated to that idea? <laughs> I think all of us on this call are infinitely more worried about privacy than your, you know, earlier millennial or, or Gen Z, and would would go so far as to say that um, the sort of privacy is not even the top concern once you get under a certain age. Take an example, right? Like if you ask any of us, or probably many in the audience, would you like to publicly stream every single payment that you make for all of your friends and everyone to see? Like I bet most anyone over pick an age forty would say, hell no. You get down, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's great. I can see what my friends are buying. It's social status, it's connectivity, it's it's all of this stuff. And so privacy or lack thereof by choice becomes a feature versus a bug. And so I think that you know, you are gonna make the consumer the calculus of, you know, is this is this worth it? But almost by enabling that sharing. It, it drives more value. And we see that with, um, you know, social trading that's going on right now. Like finance used to be this very, very private thing. Now being public, what stocks you've bought, talking about them is very, very much a feature versus something we need to be concerned about. Yep, okay. Did somebody wanna add something to that privacy? Okay. All right, uh, before I move on to the final area of financial inclusion, let me, I'm going to turn my attention to some of the qu more questions we've been receiving in the, from the audience. Uh, and again, I would encourage anybody uh, who's interested in asking a question, please please put it in the chat box. Um, let's see, from uh, Mark Reifenberg, as more firms migrate into a cloud-based platform that is controlled by just a few third parties like uh, AWS, Google, Microsoft, IBM, the banking consumers more reliant on those third parties for data security than financial institutions they have accounts at. That's in the form of a question. Are they more, <laughs> you know, reliant on, on those firms? Anybody have a view on, you know, those, those cloud providers and their, their role in this? Nope. No one wants to. No one wants to tackle Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM. <laughs> I, I can take that. I'm. I'm. I'm fond of saying that every company is going to be a fintech company, and I think a few of us touched on this. Right? Is we used to get our data only from banks. We used to get lending only from banks. All of these, and that still continues. But now with you know connected accounts, enterprise companies, consumer companies, the smart ones are all thinking. Well, I have consumers, or I have merchants what other value could I provide them? And oftentimes that looks like financial services, right? Like I love using the example of, of Uber and Lyft with, with drivers because one of their biggest expenses is recruiting drivers. 
And so once you've got the driver, you very much want to retain said driver because otherwise you're going to have to pay thousands of dollars to get a new one. How might you do that? Provide more value. So if the driver has the bank account with Lyft, you can do things like, well, I will pay you immediately after you do a day of driving or maybe even half a day of driving. I will provide you discounts on services. I will create a reward system. And so if you're going to do that, you need those Lego building blocks to enable Lyft to provide those services. And so inevitably, you know, banks will play a role in that because they often use a sponsor bank or a banking partner, but they will start to use, you know, compliance as a service, um, you know, connections into different uh, data sources as a service. Many of those companies use Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, and others as backend infrastructure. Uh, and, and the good news is these cloud companies are in the business. One of their primary values is keeping their data safe and secure. Thanks. It's not, right. not quite an answer to that, that question, but just, just to observe that certainly in Europe, um, some, of the the, some of the major platforms you're talking about already have acquired um, payment licenses. So uh, Google, for example, in Europe is, is a, a PISP. It's a payment initiation service provider, um, which, which starts, I think, to raise questions when you talk about combining data sets, because if, if, um, if you can combine, say, um, someone's browsing history, browsing activity with their transaction data, then you'd start, you're talking about some very powerful uh, combinations or commercially powerful combinations in terms of tracking, for example, seeing an ad to actually buying something, which you could do if you combine browsing history with transaction data. Um, then those are the kind of issues that I think we might be facing um, at some point in the future, to what, to what extent, with if you start combining these data sets, they, they don't just, it's not additive, it's multiplicative, and it has lots and lots of other consequences. No, I think this is the most interesting challenge and of course with alipay and and you know the chinese fintech system you're already uh you know this has already evolved and this gets to a combination of privacy and security uh concerns if you have big tech and amazon google um you know facebook all are poking around the edge of some of these services but because they have not wanted to be a, become a bank they don't want to be regulated as a bank and they have so many other commercial opportunities i think to pursue um they haven't stepped in here but i think if you um if you look at the power of artificial intelligence and the data that is available and will be available through open finance you have to assume that there will be major platforms who do aggregate this data and then form conclusions and, and set you up as sort of a high tier financial person and a mid tier. And all of those have uh, really, really complicated uh, implications. So I, I think you raise a really good question. That does not prevent me, I think, from um, advocating for an open banking system and financial structures because we need the infrastructure for those basic things to be right and secure and create more competition in order to be in a position to manage the complexities that you've described. I think we should take them on, but uh, we should do our homework by building the scaffolding right. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments on privacy, security, anything like that? Okay, let me go on then to uh, sort of the final broad area, and that's financial inclusion. Um, you know, we, we do a survey of a uh, household survey here at the FDIC, um, sort of an authoritative source on the number of uh, households that are unbanked in the U.S. And currently, there's seven million households that don't have any kind of banking relationship to deposit their checks or, or um, save for unexpected expenses. And the unbanked rate is higher for black and Hispanic households than it is for the overall uh, unbanked, uh, as it is for uh, overall. Um, so I'm wondering if any of our panelists have a view on whether open banking, expanding access, will expand access to financial services uh, to some of these households who don't have an existing banking relationship. I'm happy to start. Um, and I'll leave the consumer for a second, because I think um, John and others have uh, more to say on that, but there is absolutely no question 
that there is a gap in the market in terms of small business lending to um, black, to Hispanic, to underserved markets, and that open banking and the kind of uh, innovation in fintech and financial services has the power to get more credit worthy borrowers from who are now not getting uh, access to that capital to get them access to the capital. And part of the trick to doing that is to get them access to capital at affordable rates. And this means um, that fintechs who are currently active in the innovative area have a drawback. If they're not banks and they're not taking deposits, they're paying too much. They're paying 10 points more for their capital. So they're charging much more for these services. One of the reasons why I'm so, um, I think it's so important to get the community banks and others um, to get this open banking standard written and to get traditional banks playing uh, with more, more of these products and services is they've got much lower cost capital. They've got your deposits. So either you've got to authorize some of these new players, neobanks and whatever, to take deposits and supervise them and regulate them, or you've got to get the banks to uh, provide these services in a way that gives more access. At the SBA, we had a portfolio of $100 billion of capital, of loans, that went in a disproportionate way to minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. And that's an indication of the market gap because an SBA loan only goes to somebody who uh, the market won't serve. A bank will say, I wouldn't make this loan without an SBA guarantee. $100 billion is a lot of money. $95 billion of the $100 billion was repaid, is repaid. The loss rate on the SBA portfolio is under 5%. So you have a big market gap of people out there who are not being served by the the uh, the system, and it's mostly women and minority-owned businesses. So I really think this is, um, you know, transformative to solving that market gap. Mm -hmm. John, do you? Have you? Yeah. yeah. So, oh, oh, sorry, Bill. Sorry. You want to go, Bill? i just just make a, a couple of points. Not quite so much about the unbanked as people who are outside elements of the financial system or who are vulnerable in some other way. And the, yeah, I keep remembering the surprises we had. One of the other surprises we had was the applicability or the number of application use cases that were found by people who are in the, uh, the debt counseling area. Um, because um, Overbanking is, is a gift if you're a debt counselor because you, you're no longer dealing with bank statements that could have been snow paked and you know changed. Uh, this is um, unalterable f factual information about all the accounts that somebody has. So a debt counselor can use open banking to and special applications to apply the, the templates they normally apply to say, well, what's what's wrong? What's going wrong here? How can we help you get back on a level footing? And so you can get your debt counseling costs you less, or you can do uh, much more debt counseling for the same amount of money. It's been one one big application that we've seen. And the other is, as I mentioned earlier on, people with thin credit files, particularly millennials in the UK, they don't have, uh, they don't own property. It's property in the UK, London in particular, is ludicrously expensive. Um, so they, they don't have, they don't have property to own, which um, cuts them out of um, a, a lot of, uh, of the better credit deals because they can't demonstrate they've been paying a mortgage for 10 years or something like that. So there, there are a number of applications now which uh, effectively provide an alternative kind of credit rating service which takes account of the way you've been managing your bank account. So how, how often do you go into overdraft? Well, I can, I can demonstrate that now very easily using open banking. So there, there has not so much for the non-banked, the unbanked, more for people on the periphery of, of banking services who are somehow kept out, but are now allowed in. Yeah, I think um, just to push on that point, um, we've also seen that with, like take for instance, a, a population of a 550 FICO score, right? Where 
chances are your options are to go to a very, very expensive payday lending shop. There are now fintech companies that have been able to use open banking, which allows them access to the bank account, and they can do cash flow underwriting. And what some have seen is that, you know, it's obvious that not all 550s are created equal, but developing algorithms like if you actually, if you never let your balance dip below $50, turns out you're being overcharged by most of the financial system, and you're actually much better credit risk than your FICO score might demonstrate. And that enables consumers to then take lower risk loans and eventually walk their way back up to where they would have better access to more affordable financial products. Mm -hmm. John, any final thoughts on uh, the financial inclusion topic? Yeah, so a, a couple of very quick thoughts. One, uh, just want to acknowledge that, you know, this is a panel of, of five white folks talking about financial inclusion for uh, black and Latino communities, um, which I think should go recognized as, as we're doing it, uh, but isn't necessarily a barrier to then digging in because one of the things that I think is most exciting about the way in which open finance is lowering the barriers to entry for new entrants is you can have great, uh, you know, new neo banks like Greenwood, an African American neo bank founded for uh, African American borrowers. Like the barrier to entry for them to get started was much lower uh, than the traditional barrier to entry for a bank seeking a charter. And Angela talked about this, right? The idea that you can just open your laptop and you've got the AWS service and you've got these other services. The ability to have banking as a service and financial services as a service and combine these Lego bricks together does create that lower barrier. And that lower barrier means that people from traditionally uh, marginalized communities can't just get financial services. They can found financial services companies that are specifically adapted for their community and meet their community's needs frankly, better than anything I'm ever going to be able to design. Um, and I think that's one of the most exciting things about fintech. The other, uh, fintech and sort of open banking generally. The other thing that I think is really exciting is um, we've really had a long time where financial services in the brick and mortar world is based on geography, right? The reason we have a concept like redlining is because you could have a bank branch in a neighborhood and you could decide that you were lending to that neighborhood and not to the neighborhood next to it, right? It's the reason we have community reinvestment. It's the reason that we have a number of fair lending and anti-redlining laws. Um, part of the reason that was so effective at excluding some communities was the cost of finding another provider was very high. You might have to travel for miles. You might have to, especially in a rural community, go a couple of hours to find another service provider. Right now, uh, with open banking, open finance, that cost may just be moving your your thumb a quarter inch to the left on the screen of your smartphone, right? Because your smartphone now has 35 different companies in it that want to offer you a service. And uh, when you combine that with, as Bill said, you know, the ability to use your cash flow as the basis to secure a credit, as opposed to, you know, where you went to college or a credit report that may reflect some of the structural imbalances uh, that we see where, you know, if you are African-American, you are less likely to have attended college. And therefore, the number one on-ramp for a credit report is paying back a student loan. You don't have that student loan to pay back. So you're missing that on-ramp, but you still have cash flow. And when you combine that cash flow with the very easy ability to share it with uh, multiple companies that want to provide you a service with very low friction, that's another significant reduction in the barrier to entry. And, you know, you've seen some of this start to be institutionalized even by the large banks. Uh, Plaid is participating with a number of banks in a program with the OCC called uh, Project Reach, which is trying to bring cash flow underwriting into banks uh, for consumer lending in a way that it hasn't existed before. And I think all of that really is built on this data portability and uh, the benefits you get from that by opening up the financial services world to more people who have been traditionally left behind by the structures we had back in sort of the brick and mortar only days of banking. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, before we leave you, I'm looking at the questions coming in from the audience, and someone reminded us that you used uh, the term open finance, and you've been kind of interchangeably, or at least it's simultaneously, using open finance and open banking. Uh, before we end, can you uh, expound a little bit more on what the difference is? Sure, and, and, and I should apologize because it's a mild joke at Bill's expense, uh, unfortunately. So uh, open banking is, is often thought of as sort of the UK style of open banking, meaning a quasi-governmental organization has created an API. The nine largest banks are required to adopt that API, and that API covers payment accounts. The reason I say open finance is different is, I think most fundamentally, it's not just about payment accounts, it's about any part of the consumer's financial life. So that's savings, pensions, investment, uh, it is a CD, it is also maybe your payroll. It expands out that net to better match what a consumer thinks of as their financial life. The, also, the other difference is, I think, uh, the sort of more top-down uh, OBIE, that's Open Banking Implementation Entity uh, version of API adoption is probably not going to work in every country. I, I would be astonished if the United States government decides that the path they want to take is that uh, the government designs APIs. We don't have a strong track record of that uh, here. Um, so I, I think the other open finance difference is it is more of a sort of bottoms up commercial connectivity solution than uh, the one pursued in the UK market. So Bill, with, with apologies at the beginning and at the end, uh, I would define that as the key difference between open banking and open finance. Bill, would you like the opportunity to respond? <laughs> well, no, I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. The um, and we it, It's a slight misnomer that open banking is neither open nor banking really, because it, it, it doesn't cover the whole of banking services by, by a long chalk. Um, the we are we, like other jurisdictions. We're looking at the read across from open what we call open banking, which is basically about payment systems to other financial products, um, and there clearly is some. There's an obvious read across to some areas like uh, lending, uh, savings products, for example. But I, I would I would I've often said this um, as a, a note of caution here in that. It's it's kind of like you know if you if you paint your your sitting room in a particular color and you love that color and you say let's let's do the bedroom in the same color and you say oh that's, oh, that's terrific and let's, oh let's do the kitchen now and then you you like it so you say let's do the kids um, you don't, you can't necessarily apply the same solution to lots lots of different areas and what we're seeing in in open finance is that some of the principles might be the same that you need authentication you need accreditation. You need some common standards, maybe, but the, the the challenges that you face may be completely different, which is what we're saying. So, if you take pensions in the UK, occupational pensions, uh, there are forty thousand occupational pension schemes in the UK. Some of which aren't digitised, some of which are kept in pen and ink ledgers. It's a very different situation from banking, where we have nine banks who, between them, have ninety five percent of the market. So. I think there is a lot of learning, a lot of read across from what what we see in the context of transactional data to other elements of other financial services products. Um, I just don't think exactly the same solution will work in all, in all cases. It's going to be different. And it'll be different in different jurisdictions too because they have different market structures. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just have a, a few minutes left here. Um, so let me just ask a general question. Is, is, is there anything anything important we haven't covered? Any final comments, anything, uh, any gaps we need to fill uh, for our audience before we before we bring this uh, uh, outstanding webinar uh, to, a, uh, to a close? I'll add one thing to consider, which is a lot of this conversation and a lot of open banking and open finance generally is framed as a way for the consumer to take their bank account information and share it with someone else. Um, I think the next important frontier, and hopefully it's one we're coming to soon, is not just a one-way data flow, but a network and multi-directional data flow. My financial information at Wells Fargo is the same financial information, it's mine, as it is at Chime. And so there's no reason that I should be able to share Wells Fargo data with Chime, but not Chime data with Wells Fargo. So I do think the next big frontier and something for banks and bank regulators to think about is what about when banks start consuming this data from fintechs? That's where we need to go, that full network with the consumer at the center. 
And that's a different vision for open banking. It's not where banks are a data source and that's all they are. It's where banks are as much a fintech as the fintechs themselves are, and fintechs are as much a data source as the banks are. I think that's the critical next step in uh, in the development of the market. 100%. Bill, um, you might what add to that just in the framing of open banking initially has been banks lose, consumers win. And I think in the world that John is talking about, everybody stands to benefit. Banks, consumers, other companies adding banking, and how does this rising tide enable everyone to be more competitive and offer better services? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. the challenge for this, uh, as we come forward, the challenge for this, Diane, is really for the regulators. Because we have, you know, somewhere between seven and 57 regulators of this activity um, in the US, and they're not coordinated um, they don't have a joint view vision of the outcome uh, that they want to see for the country. And I think creating some kind of cohesive outcome that benefits consumers, that is more inclusive, that drives the economy better, that benefits both banks and innovators, um, you know, is within the vision. I think you heard a lot of that articulated today. So how do we get a regulatory framework uh, cherishing the fact that we have actually great regulators and a, a good regulatory environment, um, how do we get the coordination so that we don't have our institutions getting conflicting messages um, from a state regulator versus a federal one or between you know, two or three federal ones? I think that's really important for the positive evolution of this activity and probably pretty hard to get done, but we have, we are optimistic. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I just make one. I just make one observation there, which is, is I think we can see that you know that somebody once said it, it's it's a, it's very great talent to distinguish between a splash, a wave, and a tide, uh, and this feels like a tide to me. And we're seeing not just financial data being shared these days, but a lot of other data being shared. Picking they're doing some great things in, in Australia with that, um, and I, I think. Maybe this is sort of stepping outside my role for a minute, but the that to me does seem like an opportunity for conventional banks because it it isn't if there's a lot of data being shared, uh, some of it quite sensitive. I mean, it isn't just your money that you need to keep safe these days; it's your data too. So there there do seem to be, and I think some of some of the UK banks are already beginning to um, consider this. It, it's that. Who, who would you trust to look after your data if if there are, if this network that John is talking about is going to exist? And some of the bank brands are, are well placed, I think, to to actually a, a, adopt that. But I think we are going to see, as, as John said, more and more different types of data being shared, um, which will create opportunities uh, that we as yet we really can't can't envisage yet at this stage. Mm -hmm. All right, and all, uh, point, points well taken about the uh, about the need for sort of regulatory coordination. Um, look, I want to thank you all, our steam panelists, so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to share with us your knowledge and experience on this topic. I think it's been incredibly informative. Um, and and again, thank you so much for participating. I want to thank our audience uh, for tuning in. And for those of you who are interested, we're going to have one more uh, webinar that in our five part webinar series next month. Um, this will be on reg tech and sub tech. That will be uh, moderated by our uh, chief innovation officer, Sultan Medji. Uh, so I encourage anyone who's interested to stay tuned uh, for, on our website for, uh, for details on that. And again, thank you, everyone. And since our, our time is up, I'll, I'll now uh, bring this to closure and, and, and wish everyone a, a great rest of their day. Thank you. Yeah.